Lisa Kerr, New York University. So thank you. That was a fantastic panel. And Peter, that was really inspiring. Um, there's no doubt that you are um, digging deep on how to teach, and, and I learned a lot from that. Um, two questions. Uh, the first for Professor Hess. Uh, so I'm a quarter of the way through the book, and after hearing your presentation, I'm going to go and finish it immediately. Um, I was struck, I read the first part, which actually sets out those 26 teachers, and I was somewhat struck by how, and we could have a debate about how the rank, whether the rankings are correct, that Heather Gherkin is really the only teacher who's at the top, you know, one of the top five, so-called top five elite American schools. UCLA is there, Florida State's there, of course those were, those are top schools as well. But I was struck by how the 26 best teachers are really not clustered in the 26 so-called best law schools. And what, is, what did you take away from that in terms of whether rankings are incorrect or whether the demands in terms of scholarship and teaching are sort of, out of you know, maybe not uh, the way they should be in, at, at top institutions? And then the second question for Dean Sassen, um, this experiential model, what I learned at your presentation and over lunch seems so exciting. And my question is where the experience involves the delivery of a legal service, uh, does Osgood try to ensure that those are social justice areas. So if it's IP or if it's business and there's legal service component, is that sort of a loss in terms of the historical connection between clinical education and social justice? Thanks for the question. Um, a couple of comments. One, we actually had 29 subjects to start with, um, and then two of them, three of them dropped out. Um, one of them was Elizabeth Warren from Harvard. Um, she had other things to do. Um, she <laughs> run an agency, become a US senator. Uh, um, and as I think back about the 250 nominations, I think they really did run the gamut um, the full gamut of the spectrum in legal education in the US, I think that teachers from the top schools were more likely to say, no thanks. Uh, uh, so been nominated, delighted to have been nominated, but no, I'm not going to take the time it takes to engage in this process. And I think part of that is because that has nothing to do with their reward system. And uh, thanks, uh, Lisa, for the question. I do think it actually has um, shifted what has been a historic relationship, not just at Osgoode, but I think throughout um, the community that engages with clinical legal education as social justice oriented to uh, a much more pluralist model. So at, uh, at Osgoode, it's not that the um, uh, programs like uh, Parkdale or CLASP <coughs> or ones that for 40 some odd years have been beacons of social justice for the school and, and you know, helping shape a, a zeitgeist at the place that we take a lot of pride in. Uh, but it has been important to say, no matter what your area of interest, no matter what your passion, there is going to be a meaningful experiential outlet. So in IP, in a business law clinic, uh, in, uh, and the IP clinic is an innovation uh, tech transfer uh, clinic where uh, the idea is to provide assistance turning uh, great research ideas into uh, those that can come to a commercial market. Business Law Clinic works specifically with uh, new Canadian communities trying to get established, especially in our part of Toronto. So I wouldn't say these aren't social justice, but they're certainly going far beyond that poverty law uh, core. And I think that's a good thing. I think, you know, uh, Harry made the point there are some classes that are hard to imagine uh, lending themselves to an experiential component. But I, I would think long and hard before giving up on the idea that it's worth trying. And, and even the deepest um, uh, philosophical or legal theory or legal history venture, I think there's something to really be gained by putting that in action. And I think you can put most of it uh, in action when that becomes the focal point of collective curricular and creative undertakings. And just to pick up on the last two presentations, increasingly opportunities are opening up to do that in digital formats. And at Osgood, we partnered with uh, ANU and Paul Maharg, who was mentioned uh, by Richard Susskind in particular, on looking at uh, simulated and other kinds of digital models to allow this. Now, Paul's gone even further and is now into avatars and gaming and all sorts of interesting, but I find, uh, you know, less easily applied uh, settings for legal education. But if we get together in 10 years, uh, maybe we'll look back on that 
uh, as a quaint notion uh, as, as more and more of these ideas come to the service of our core missions and mandates, but in ever more engaging, approachable, accessible ways. Thank you very much for that. That was a really tremendous panel. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, my question relates to the text. So I, mean, I, I fully agree with Peter and with, uh, with Joe and, and Stephen that there is a generational change in the, the learning styles of the students that we have in front of us. But what about the, you know, the, the core skill that lawyers, I would think, still have to have, which is to engage very deeply in perhaps a non-crowdsourced, unaditated, with no comments, case, commentary, and to immer you know, immerse deeply in that and take something out of it that's useful for your learning, for your client's objectives, for your brief, et cetera. And I could be wrong about this, but anecdotally, it seems to me we're losing that a little bit with this generation. It's not visual. I'm not sure if it can be made visual. So if any of you uh, have some suggestions about that, I'd love to hear them. Uh, yeah, just to start off, actually, you know, it's very interesting. I'm not sure if the generation's just not there yet, but one of the things we did is when we run our pilots, first of all, I, I just polled my students from the beginning, and I'm sure it wasn't a great, you know, polls should be very scientific, and you have to worry about how you state them. I'm sure it wasn't, but nonetheless, the results were shocking how many students said, you know, if you give me a digital textbook, I will print the damn thing out, right? And, 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 that, and, that's, and that's what I want to do, you know, and, and that's what I would do with it, and very high numbers. And, and the other thing we found is it, when, we, when we ran the results afterwards, students would say, you know, it's too noisy. I don't want that noise. So I, I felt good about that in the sense that at least law students realized you need to really read the text. And so we realized, I mean, our interface was very clunky. It was just an alpha, you know, we're getting better. Um, but we really did realize it has to be clean. You have to be able to remove all the distractions but yet have the power. And that's actually what I think is proving so hard and programming the thing the right way is how do you get both. But um, I, so I, I mean, I agree. I think we, we, if we lost that as lawyers, we would be losing something completely fundamental to our identity. What I sort of liked is I think our students did get it. Uh, they wanted just the text and then be able to still have the power to branch out, but on my time, in my terms, you know, don't screw with Brandeis or whatever, right? I mean, I, I want to read, you know, what, what he or she had to say. And just a quick point on that. I don't think we should assume that the language that you know, you're invoking of uh, courtroom advocacy, for example, is static either. In other words, if Peter's right, and we learn and are persuaded by visual representations far more than numbered paragraphs and written text, then the cognitive dissonance of why we would build advocacy in courtrooms on numbered paragraphs and written text becomes more and more present. And some of you will know the work of uh, uh, Regina Austin at uh, Penn, for example, who has a visual advocacy clinic. Uh, and there they take on cases that are particularly about discretionary results like uh, applications for mercy or, or things of this nature uh, and work with students to create documentaries that make submissions in purely uh, uh, visual and oral forms uh, without any written supplement. Uh, and I think that's the future as well. As the world becomes more engaged in this way of communicating and persuading, we shouldn't expect it's just about legal education. It's about transforming the business of laws we've heard, advocacy, what happens in courtrooms, tribunals, where those happen, in digital formats, not just in old edifices in the center of town. And that's the dynamic nature of this enterprise as we move back and forth with pushes and pulls in all directions. Yeah, I should probably just add, I think Steve knows this already, but just in case it wasn't clear from my presentation, um, when I was distinguishing between visual, I was trying to distinguish between visual as opposed to oral. So I wasn't really talking about uh, eschewing reading. In fact, many flipped classrooms, and I have chosen in my evidence class to reduce the readings for other reasons, but uh, many flipped classrooms do the same readings. There's no change. You read the cases, you process them. The flip is simply designed to help them process that material in a way that's of assistance to them. Uh, um, exactly as most people would do in the first 20 minutes of a lecture in their class. So, I mean, that's, that's really all it is. I don't, uh, I don't think it, it harms the skills you're trying to get at. That was a really terrific panel and, and well worth waiting the afternoon of the second day for. Um, Peter, I've got a question for you and, and Joe and Stephen. Um, please jump in on this one. But um, one possible extension, maybe even the inevitable extension of the flipped classroom is the no classroom or at least no physical classroom. And so I'm wondering if you've thought about what it is that you do in the classroom 
I'm sure you have. Yeah, and, nothing else. And, and then how one translates that into a no physical classroom environment. And here's where the, the social reading seemed to be one avenue in which the no classroom be, could become the no, the virtual classroom that was really a meaningful space in which students can learn. And so this social reading struck me as one idea, but I'd like to hear more about what you do in the classroom and translating that. Yeah, I, I, I obviously think a great deal. In fact, the whole idea of the flip was not to create the flip. It wasn't backwards. It was all designed to do better what I try to do in the classroom. Um, so in a sense, I haven't thought of a no classroom situation because everything I've done has been to try and enhance the actual classroom experience. And many of my students are here. You can ask with them in detail about what I try and do in the classroom. But I can tell you, I, I am a huge believer in that one-to-one -one connection with the students and freeing myself of lecture time allows me to do that. So I'm able to actually try and communicate with those students. I'm able to go around as they are working on problems. There's actual small, I do small group work. I try and do, I've, I, I'm, I'm evolving, this is year one. So I'm trying to get to the point where I'll have students advocate different positions, try and develop advocate <laughs> skills in the classroom. But I, I, I strongly believe in the classroom as being the key component. That's what I said in my talk. It's the most valuable part of it. So the, the flip is just designed to give them the basic. I mean, there's no question. I, I mean, I see what you're saying. And I, I suppose I could design online courses that would take out the classroom component. But I still believe that the classroom is where the best learning takes place. And I'm able to really work with them so what we do after, I, I, I didn't make this about my class and problem solving, but essentially we would work through the problems together. So they have a small group where they work on it, and then we would extract the principles, and I would pose questions to them. And it was a very, it became a very interactive class because the students had worked on the problems. That's the difference between just trying to ask them questions about what they've read, giving them the time to work on the problems, and then interact with them. And to me, that changed everything. Yeah, and if I can just add to that very briefly, the, the way that we um, conceptualized social reading was not to replace the classroom, but to enhance classroom discussion. And that ended up happening with my class and with Stephen's class, which is that you would get some great dialogue that may not have occurred in the classroom that started before class, and you just launch from there. And a side benefit is that you'd get dialogue from voices that would be reluctant um, to, to participate in the classroom. They're just better and more comfortable at responding you know, on the page rather than the classroom, but you can still draw in that discussion. Okay, just, just, you know, I'm trying to keep a speaker's list. Uh, Douglas, did you uh, come over to ask a question? Yes, no? I did. Uh, oh, no, sorry. No? Okay, so then what I've got uh, Thomas, Gale. I've got a speaker's list. You know you're up there, Eric. Go ahead. Go ahead. You got prerogative. Just, prerogative. Just, just prerogative. people are feeling anxious because I know there's a, I, I can sense some demand in the room. Okay, so we, i got uh, uh, Thomas, Gale, uh, Rosalie. Is it Scott? I'll ask my question uh, quickly. One thing that struck me, Peter, um, about your presentation is, is there's something, maybe a disincentive built into the change because they, all you need is an iPad and don't worry and, oh, but it's really hard. And, you know, you, no, 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 I meant to say it was inexpensive. You, I didn't say it was <laughs> easy. I said but, it was inexpensive. But, but probably um, one of the things that, that struck me was how do we make an institutional move towards techniques that work? Because if... Uh, every single professor is just an independent entrepreneur that may or may not take on these techniques. It's going to be a very slow evolution to change. And so I'm wondering about how institutions make moves for techniques that work, um, or whether we need to just rely uh, on a, a kind of slow incrementalism. And you know, maybe, Lauren, you have some thoughts about how you move to a, a universal opportunity um, in, in with resistance at an institutional level, um, do we need to do that as teaching practices? Thanks. Well, I, I can say because I was mentioning it to um, uh, Peter earlier that we are actually at uh, Osgood in the midst of a year-long uh, planning cycle on a digital initiative, which is exploring exactly this question, not just in the classroom and pedagogy, but in dissemination of research, our journals, what the digital commons will look like, student experience, should you be choosing courses on the phone, on the subway in, or is that meant to be in person with advising? Uh, what are the areas in which we don't want to go? And, and to Doug's point, I am proposing for, uh, both because I believe in it and because I think it's important to have these experiments, uh, what would be if approved the first uh, uh, digital uh, JD course at Osgood on digital lawyering, which seemed to me a very appropriate uh, topic to explore in exactly that format. And, it, and the reason it's important to do it is it forces you to ask questions like, how do we assign credit weight? Well, right now we do it on contact hours. So what's that going to look like in a world in which contact hours doesn't drive 
the depth or level of connection. And I think already with Peter's experience, contact hours isn't going to capture the level of depth of his teaching. So that's great for an institution because it requires that kind of collective debate and ultimately buy-in uh, in order to do this, and it needs resources. And that's what we found with experiential learning. We'll find it with digital. Uh, it's going to require some early adopters. It's going to require some facilitation, experimentation, assessment and review of what works, and ultimately choosing a course forward that isn't just chasing the next bright, shiny, great $5 app, but actually letting us do things that are core to our mission and mandate better. And I say that as a member of a faculty that welcomed hundreds of thousands of dollars to transform classrooms so that they would have digital modem hookups, uh, because that was the future in 1994, uh, only to then renovate them all again to build in wireless capacity uh, and have to imagine what, do we, what should we do for the next uh, uh, you know, 10 years so as not to have obsolete infrastructure because uh, a lot of this does require that kind of uh, good bones to a law school in order to make it uh, able to uh, have digital capacity. So all of that is to say with each experiment, each leader and early adopter, there are great institutional conversations that need to be had as well. You know, I just have 15 seconds. You know, I actually think Professor Hess's barometer is the answer. In other <laughs> words, you, you have to be your own professor, as we all know, right? I mean, if you try to teach the way somebody else teaches, you can learn from someone else's teaching, but you will not be the best professor. And so I would be very against mm -hmm. trying to make any professor, not just because it's the right thing to do, uh, but because you, won't get, you will not get as good teaching if you try to force any. So I, I don't think a school really should. I think they should try to enable all, all the Peters and everyone else in the world whatever they want to do. But I think it'd be a big mistake to try to say, you know, this is now the way we're going to teach at the University of Alberta because it just will not be as good an experience for students. Yeah, I'm now worried my message was, this is the answer, um, this is what you must do to be a good teacher, which was not my message at all, of course, and Eric darn well knows that, but um, in any event, um, it, it, it's not. The, the point is to say, I agree, and uh, there are many different ways to get there, and the goal is to, well, what I'm trying to say is, one, is we need to be constantly thinking about it, and I think every law school should have in place a structure, like Dean Sawson has suggested, that is, con is, is having the, the academics who work there constantly thinking about different ways of getting at this problem, and second of all, I, I think that we need to make it uh, available. I think there are some people who would like to do this, but they're inhibited, they're fearful. They don't know what it is, they don't know how to do it, and they just don't want to engage with that. And I think every faculty needs to have a way of, of, of putting on sessions or discussing, you know, as I'm going to Osgood Hall to talk about this in November, say, this is what I do, here's why you might want to do it, and that's what needs to be done. And we've done that in our school, and now we have people so, picking up initiatives. Peter, just to follow up, what's the proprietary piece of this? Because you mentioned students have access 24-7, but you have this elusive... Uh, you know, kind of reference to the Khan Academy at, at the outset in the title. And that's, of course, a model built on open access. Uh, is there a good principled reason why I can't just access your capsules day and night myself at, as well? At, at the moment, yes. The, because many of my capsules violate copyright if I put them out freely. But I'm in the process of reconstructing them, and eventually I will make them open access. That's the plan. I'm reconstructing the graphics to take out anything that's copyright oriented, and then I can make it open source, and anybody will have access to them. Now, my capsules are related to my class. I actually reference class themes, so they won't be of complete use to everybody, but on the basics, there's no question. What happened in my class last year, my class has, we have a website which allows my class to sign up to capsule use. So what happened at the beginning was I saw all my students and I had 51 students in the class, or 50 students, and I had 50 people on my website. By mid-semester I had 65 students on my website because the students in the other evidence classes were suddenly signing up. They're like, this free resource is available, it explains it. And by the end of the class I had over 75. And that's just the way it is. So you're right. There is nothing about it. I do think it should be open source and made available and anybody can watch it. But uh, yeah, the copyright is the primary issue. Yeah, and, and Dean Sawson, pending open source, the copyright protection is going to prevent Osgood from scooping in and scooping this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not available for us. So I, um, in, in reflecting on why I found this such an invigorating panel, because it, it truly was, I think it's because we, we've it was the first time that students really appeared in the, in the discourse, right? And each of you talked about, about students and, in, and, um, and we didn't just talk about them like, okay, their drills or their holes or what have you, but, but they really came as alive as agentic 
participants in this thing we call legal education and what the law school is. And um, in uh, Peter, in your presentation, I remember seeing this at Cult too, where you're actually you know, interviewing students, you hire research assistants and interviewing and hearing them, and gosh, they're pretty thoughtful, intelligent people, aren't they? And yeah. with the crowdsourcing for the textbook and seeing their comments and thinking about how it changed their thinking or, or soliciting submissions to find out about the impact that teaching's had on their lives, or, or indeed just having a conversation with, with a student. There's probably a lot of students who've never met their dean. And that having those kinds of lines of communication, I think, is, is really important to reflect on about where the opportunities for those modes of communication are. Um, the other observation I had is that the things that you, that each of you focused on, right? So in your class, Peter, what you're trying to get to is that interaction with the students around the problem solving. Um, or students engaging with texts in, in, in ways and, and, and connecting different media together. Or students reflecting on what they're learning is meaning for the rest of their lives. Uh, or what impact they're having in their society. Now, how do you assess those things? My question is, and, and, and I don't mean evaluate, I mean assess. So how do we, how do we get a sense of, of uh, and not just for the faculty so that we can give you know, uh, degrees and stuff, but to help students to know how they can assess it, not just for during their time in law school, but for the rest of their lives. So, so how do you maybe valorize those competencies or skills or um, uh, passions that seem to really be at the heart of what all of you are talking about and also give students the tools to to be able to sort of reflect on whether they're actually developing towards that that wisdom. Good question. You want to start? Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge you question. Go ahead. Well, I'll just say one quick comment, which I which I don't know if you're very helpful, but you know I had a wonderful colleague in my last school, and I think you know we we do have one performance metric, which is student evaluations. It's not perfect, but here's what his point was. You know, when student evaluations are good, we trumpet them. And when student evaluations are bad, we roll our eyes. Oh, well, that's students. You know, what the hell do they know, right? Um, uh, and, and they don't, and, and I, I, I think there's a little bit of that. I mean, I honestly think um, there, there's a tendency in the academy to say, you know, you're a popular teacher and you're just really lucky. You know, I, I wish I was like you, but I, you know, I'm not. And so I, I don't have it. I mean, it's hard. It, it, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess if we could just... So the one thing that reminds me of that is really do listen to the students. I think listen to evaluations, listen to the other aspects. But you have much deeper questions I'm not getting to. But then the one thing is reorient the incentives of institutions to recognize that you're not lucky when you're a good teacher. It's because I spent eight hours in this dang lecture, right? And I really want it to be perfect. I get nervous before every time I teach. And I think that's a good sign. I want to quit teaching the day I don't get nervous before I teach. Because I, I want everything to go well. And I'm sure, you know, it doesn't always. But, but um, I don't. I don't think that's incentivized at all in, in our in our structure, and, and that's just a real shame. Yeah. And can I address what I think is another aspect of your question, which is how, how do you evaluate students so they get a sense how they're doing? And, and I, I think if you're going to move classes uh, out of the class, like on the social media platform, uh, you can't abandon the students. You cannot abandon them. If you if you you can't drop a question the student asks in class, you should be engaged outside of class on the platform. And what students have told me in feedback is that's some of the most valuable uh, dialogue they've had is not in the classroom, but when you engage them, when they've had a chance to read what you've wrote, written in response, and then they respond to you and other students chime in. And so it's really important that you stay engaged and not just sort of offload all of your teaching to, to technology. Just a, a couple of quick uh, thoughts. Uh, one is I agree with everything that's been said, but in a way, we ask the important questions at precisely the wrong time, which is just when students have finished uh, a course. <laughs> and what I would like to do is take those anecdotal reflections as I'm meeting alumni 5, 10, 15 years later and actually bring some uh, rigor to uh, assessing with our graduates five years out what was the most meaningful part uh, of law school. What would you want to not have done over again now that you are wherever you are and, and so forth. So I think there's a lot more of that longitudinal reflection that we miss and shouldn't. And then second, when you move in an experiential direction or digital or others, it actually does uh, give rise to new challenges and opportunities in evaluation. Experiential, for example, you want to understand not just the student experience, but what impact did the students have in the worlds that they interacted with and how can that be brought into uh, our discussion? Because, uh, you know, if we've got students going into our neighborhood high schools through the laws program, well, it's important, what did the students gain? What did the high school students gain? What did the principals and teachers gain? And then what did the law school institutionally gain from the students taking on other leadership roles because of the enabling that came out of that experience? So 
those are exactly the right puzzles for us to worry about and come up with what will ultimately be partial, uh, not complete or perfect, but answers that take seriously the transparency and accountability of evaluation beyond just the evaluations piece that we you know, live with even though none of us are thrilled with it. I'm going to address the lasting learning piece um, in this way. So we have a chapter on lasting learning, and if I had to characterize that in 100 words or less, where does lasting learning come from? The answer was almost always modeling. That the, so what alumni were talking about was, oh, what did I learn from Julie Nice? I learned work ethic. I learned diligence. I learned respect. Um, and you, know, you don't talk about those things. You live those things. You show those things. Um, and one of, the, one of the themes that came through that chapter was humility. Um, so students talked about watching a teacher walk down to the homeless shelter, put on an apron every Friday, and start serving meals. Yeah, that's where lasting learning comes from. a basically brand new law professor. So my question is very practical and somewhat self-interested, but I know there's a few other of us in the room. So Stephen, I think you may have already answered it in uh, what you said to the last question, um, but it's, I guess, primarily directed to Jerry and Peter, but if other people want to uh, jump in. My question is, you know, uh, Jerry, you talked about how, and this was somewhat reassuring that the best law teachers were sort of 20 years out. So it was reassuring to hear that it is a process. I'm not expecting to be good at it right away. And Peter, I appreciated that you said it is hard work. And as a new professor, there are other pressures on my time. So, you know, rather than kind of giving up in despair, what's the like the one thing you would say I should do now, like the first step in that process of becoming uh, one of the really good teachers? I'm going to cheat and say two things. Um, so um, the first thing is I think most of us have, as teachers have something that we're good at, some core aspect of our teaching that we're good at. And my number one recommendation is keep trying to get better at that. So whatever it is that you're doing right now that you think, yeah, this is the best thing I do, great. Keep doing that. Get better at that. And then very slowly over time, add other things. Oh, here's, a, here's something I haven't tried I'd like to try. Um, and, and slow, small change. If you make one change every semester, five years out, you've got 10 new things. Um, so yeah, uh, slow change over time. Do what you're good at. Well, you can see me anytime, Gail, so I'll keep it short. But I, I will say two things also. I'll cheat because I want to add in my favorite, which has nothing to do with anything we talked about. But um, the first one I would say is share. We're so insular. It's unbelievable. People just don't share. It's like, why should I reinvent the wheel when somebody else has already done it? So, I mean, like, I, you know, I walk into a school and I'm like, the first thing I do is, well, you've taught this before. Can I see everything you have? Like, give it to me. I may like it, not like it, whatever. But you'd be amazed how nobody else, a lot of, well, no, I shouldn't say nobody else, but a lot of people don't do that. Like, just take, steal. I'm going to read that book. I'm going to find 26 other things I've never done before. But I'm going to tell you my favorite thing that I think to be a good teacher, which you may or may not agree with, and it's just my own selfish little thing that has nothing to do with teaching. By all means, get to know your students' names. Know them all well. They really value it. It's, for me, the best connection you can make. I get to know them as quickly as I can, and I try to keep those names as long as I can, because when, when I get to see them, I want to see them as people, and I feel they feel more invested in learning when they know that I'm invested in them. So that's the first thing. that I've been doing it for a long time, and uh, I continue to do it in every class that I teach. Virtually every student we interviewed said that. Yeah. And, I, and I just think, you know, you've already, in my opinion, done the right thing as you've asked the question. I think you have to take the risk of caring, too, which sounds really trite and stupid. But in other words, there's a huge uh, push in, in, in academics, you, oh, students, right? Or again, oh, evaluations, those don't mean anything. I think you have to risk being willing to think they do mean something. I mean, we're all pretty shallow in, in some sense. We're all insecure, I guess I should say, in some sense. And it hurts a little bit if you really want to be good, because you have to re recognize you're not always, you know, and, and what to change. And so it's really trite, but it took me years, I think, to where I would get my shells off a little bit and just be willing to take the stab a little bit to realize 
I could have handled that situation a lot better, you know, with that student and a lot more maturely. And, it still and, happens, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's never, it's never ending. Just ask my students. I've had bad days, here. and they'll be the yeah. first to tell you. Yeah. They're here. It's way easier to write about and talk about <laughs> teaching than it is to actually do it. And I, I would just add to be try, I mean, embrace that insecurity and don't lose it. Don't be too complacent. Um, I'm in my 11th year of teaching, and, and I still spend about as much time preparing as I did my first year. Uh, I think that's important. Yeah. Okay, so you know, we got Rosalie, uh, Scott, Stella, and then gentlemen, you're from Wiedner University? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have a brief comment and then I have a question. My brief comment is that ever since our presentation yesterday morning on how graduate legal education is missing from the discourse, it has remained absent from this entire conference. Uh, so I'm not sure that whether that just reinforces our point as true or we made absolutely no impact on this conference at all. Um, but uh, the comment I want to make is that as outdated and as lack of innovation there is in undergraduate or JD uh, law teaching, there's even less innovation in graduate teaching and that has to change radically um, because the model of a graduate student um, in sort of uh, solitary uh, interaction with one law professor as their mentor who gives them everything is just not realistic and it's not working um, and we have to we talk about it in our paper about how we have to move to sort of a multi mentor uh, um, model for graduate students but that's my comment my question is for Jerry Hess. Uh, uh, the title of your book is What the Best Law Teachers Do. And I'm intrigued by the word law. What is different about being a law teacher? Why isn't it what the best teachers do? Is there something unique about law teaching or legal education? I need to be careful here. Uh, so there is a book called What the Best College Teachers Do, right? <laughs> 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 written by Ken Bain, published by Harvard University Press. Um, uh, but now seriously, the, so here's my experience in working with law teachers about um, teaching and learning. Is I was once at a conference, oh this conference was actually in Calgary. Um, I was at a conference in Calgary about teaching and the conference organizers had brought in somebody who had just written um, How People Learn. Uh, this, he had written it in 2000 with a group of other people. He did a fabulous um, presentation on how people learn and tying that to adult education. And the people who were at the conference were all the self-selected people interested in law teaching, right? At the break after that, I had person after person come to me and say, wow, that was really interesting. Too bad it doesn't apply to law school. And it, it was the first time that I got hammered over the head with, oh, we really have to translate it for law teachers. So I think at most levels, there isn't a big difference between what it takes to be a great third grade teacher and what it takes to be a great law teacher, but there needs to be a translation for most law teachers. And in some ways, part of what's going on in this book is translation. And uh, Rosalie, just in response to your observation, I think it's actually an, an interesting um, uh, uh, other side of the coin I didn't have a chance to address on experiential learning because the goal with the JD program is how to create that base of experience uh, that those students can then draw on in their learning process. The challenge with graduate students is exactly the opposite. They've got the experience. It's how to harness it in shaping the education that they're then going to receive. So in a Graduate study groups, uh, which I was mentioning at the break, are one of our graduate-only environments. Uh, one of the goals is to crowdsource the curriculum, not to come and say, I teach on law regulation, here's the reading list, but to say, I, I, you know, this is an area of my research, here's what I've written lately, here are my interests, uh, and let's all contribute from your interests, your research, your experience, and together we'll come with the study group curriculum. And I think that's a great way of seeing the experiential challenge in reverse for graduate legal education is how to unlock that experiential knowledge uh, and bring it into the knowledge community as opposed to creating it, which is very much the uh, greater challenge on the JD side. And it does deserve more attention than it's gotten uh, on the panel. Great. Uh, Scott? And just so you know, we've got about 10 minutes left, so focus, focus, focus. As opposed to jobs, jobs, jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so not one to be done, outdone by Professor Sankoff. Professor Adams, I love you more. 
Like I may not <laughs> share offices with you, but I do visit. Um, so one thing I'm finding kind of interesting is taking Professor Suskind's uh, presentation yesterday about the future of the legal profession and the pressures that it's facing, clients asking more for less and asking for more technology. These are the exact same things that are kind of coming up as student demands, um, like more technology, we need to be better integrated, and then more for less. For example, one thing Professor Suskind talked about a lot is the outsourcing of the legal profession. What, as students, it happens all the time for us. Like sometimes professors will look and they're like, okay, that student's going into their laptop, they're going on Facebook. Well, in some cases, students are outsourcing that teaching right there and then by going <laughs> online and they're going to find another professor at Toronto, Osgoode, or somewhere else if they feel like that course um, isn't adequately meeting their needs. So like the kind of question that I was asking is how much of a role should law schools have in realizing that like, they're not just talking about technology needs to be in the classroom because that's what students need, but those are also skills that students need to develop to go into the developing like, legal profession. So how much of a role should students have in trying to pressure their faculties to get other faculty members to uptake um, and learn a little bit more about social media and technology? Well, I, I mean, I would say really quickly, though, I actually think, again, I, I think on a law faculty, one of the things that's the best thing is actually letting a thousand flowers bloom. So I, I'm a tech guy. It's what I do. I use a lot of video in class and like that. But, you know, I think you can learn an incredible amount from a professor who never turns on a video in class and who, you know, no audio, no nothing. If they did it well, you'd be riveted, I think, by, by every word. I, I genuinely believe that. So I, I actually don't think... Uh, you need to push too hard. You need to learn the skills you need to, to you know, honestly use Outlook, use, you know, case management, maybe those sort of aspects. But in the teaching, I think you're better off, actually. There's a million, you know, different styles of life in the world, and, and it's and a part of law school is learning to learn from all these different people rather than one book. Well, I, I agree with that, but I think there's a caveat, which is um, uh, there may be a million different ways to be a great teacher, but a student ought not to have to memorize a million passwords to access those great teachers. So, for example, there are lots of great products uh, out there to integrate uh, multimedia into the classroom, but if we had some using Moodle and some using Drupal and some using, uh, you know, uh, Blackboard and so on and so forth, it would be an unreasonable and unnecessary complication uh, for students. So we've made the decision not everyone has to integrate. Of course, uh, the thousand flowers of great teaching need to bloom, but for those who are going to go down that path, we've, as an institution, have said we're going to support, uh, in our case, Moodle, and that's mm -hmm. now. Uh, about over 50% of faculty have brought that into their classroom. So for students, it's seamless, it's one password, and it gets you into all of the intranet, the password-protected information, the course-based stuff. So having things that are, again, lowering the barriers of entry for faculty, lowering the costs of uh, use for students, and allowing that institutional economy of scale to make more opportunities possible uh, is an important caveat to what otherwise might be lots of preferences for different uh, platforms and different apps and, and, uh, and eventually I think this will uh, come together and, and the market will create uh, better ways of bridging from one to the other, uh, you know, from uh, uh, iPads to Kindles and Kobos and so forth. But for now I think it is something we need to pay attention to because these are not uh, uh, going to do any favors if students have a different uh, whole uh, way of approaching learning in every class that will be a barrier to their getting to the content and the style and the substance. Stella? Um, I have two questions that unfortunately do not relate to one another. The first one has to do with uh, part of thinking about how we teach is thinking about how we assess students as well. So traditionally, where a law school exam is 100% final based on a hypothetical situation, if we're trying to teach in different ways than a lecture style or a Socratic method, which was also the traditional form, I would like to know what your thoughts are on assessing students and what would be effective ways of doing that. The second question, it's become really sexy in education to talk about massive open online courses, which are of course usually open to the public, are not there's no formal requirement to register, they're free, although there's some discussion about whether they should be tied to programs or whether they should include some sort of a uh, fee component. I'd also like your thoughts on whether you think MOOCs fit in legal education, and if so, how they would fit. I'll, I'll speak on the first one. Um, I've already given a short opinion on the second one. 
with my own preference, but not everything else. But on the first one, the question of evaluation, I, I tend to think there are, it, it really is, I, first of all, I'm a big, huge believer in alternative forms of assessment, and I'm always trying to look at different ways. And I believe that it depends upon, to some extent, what I'm trying to get out of the course, because I do have different objectives for my different courses. So with my evidence class, I continue to maintain a 100% exam final. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is I'm not ashamed to say there are only so many hours in my day, and I just spent 200 hours making these ridiculous capsules. So uh, <laughs> there, there's only so much more alternative assessment I'm going to do. But, but nonetheless, I actually think for that class, it's well suited. It actually makes sense. The entire class is building towards their ability to assess problems. That's the main focus of that class. And the, the exam is, is a series of problems that mirror what we've done. So I'm able to assess. I actually think it's a fair evaluation of what they've done all semester. But in my other classes, I'm not doing that at all. And I do believe that alternative forms of assessment have to partially uh, mirror what it is we're trying to get them to achieve. We have to be thinking again, what are the learning outcomes? And in my other classes, I've come up with, again, not uniquely myself, but I've borrowed or taken all sorts of different forms of assessment that are designed to test their oral skills or test their ability to write academic articles or other forms of commentary or memorandums. And, and we've had uh, symposiums all designed to look at alternative forms of assessment. So I agree that the, the, the assessment has to be a, a critical part of thinking when you're thinking about what you're trying to achieve in the course. I guess I just I disagree slightly on the fact that the exam itself has to be wrong, because I still believe it has merit for certain types of classes. Great. Our guest from Wiedner. Um, it's, it's Widener. <laughs> it's fine. It happens all the time. That's Canadian pronunciation. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so um, so I, I have a, a, just a very quick comment and, and a question. One comment is that it seems so obvious if you were to look at, at our system uh, without the bias of all the history, that there should actually be some kind of training somewhere in pedagogy. And that seems just... Incre an incredible oversight in the entire history of what we've been doing. Um, but my, my question it really follows up on this whole thread of discussion about ways to sort of structure the kind of changes um, that this panel's been talking about into the curriculum, particularly um, what uh, Peter and uh, Joe and Steve talked about, but to some extent what, what Lauren talked about as, as well. And I I'd just like to, to sort of extend what's been said so far. Steve said, and it sort of was the end of the discussion, that we should really let a thousand flowers bloom and that there shouldn't be some sort of institutional um, coercion of people to teach in, in uh, a particular way. And then in, another, uh, in answer to another question, Lauren explained that um, there's ways in which we can uh, simplify and harmonize the technology, which I think everybody would, would agree that that makes sense. But just going a little bit further on the question, you know, it strikes me that we do all sorts of things institutionally to facilitate the traditional model. For example, just following up on assessments of having one final exam. When you sign up for the course, there's the registrar schedules final exams, and that's structured into the whole fabric of the way courses are traditionally taught. Um, they're traditionally expected, and the students reinforce this, that you go in and you do a traditional kind of lecture, Socratic thing. And so I'm wondering wondering without coercion what sort of institutional structures there are that can be rethought about that can facilitate the types of changes without forcing them but that can make sort of the default model what might be better pedagogy. Thanks. Well, let me take a quick uh, shot at that. Um, uh, and I think actually in, in response to the last um, question, by the way, I think MOOCs uh, do belong in law schools and are uh, part of uh, what I hope is a uh, a public uh, component to this future, but, but it's going to increasingly ask the question, what exactly uh, do you do as a law school to add value? If I can get much of the substantive information with any uh, you know, kind of search engine and I can now get more and more of the analysis and the style and the personality in these ways, what's, what's really going on in, in that classroom uh, or in that law school that makes it you know, worth the tuition, the effort, the, the years? Uh, and I think that is actually not as simple a question as it might first sound, and it relates to what, what you're saying, is, is you've got to come together and say, here's how uh, we see embracing uh, these kinds of platforms in this kind of future 
augmenting and enhancing what we are, what we stand for, and what we want to invite others to be a part of our community for. Uh, and that's why I think, for example, the experiential digital convergence is what's so exciting, among other things, uh, at Osgood. And the way you can promote that without compelling it uh, is to create the institutional center of gravity, the uh, resources, the incentives, get the people like Peter in to talk to uh, faculty. We had one of our own early adopters, uh, Ben Berger, uh, just introduce multimedia in his evidence class as a way that was uh, you know, very easy uh, uh, to uh, enter into this world in dipping your toe, even if you weren't prepared yet uh, to plunge. And, and ultimately, I think what happens is, generationally, as that center of gravity changes, it becomes part of uh, hiring, recruitment, becomes part of who you celebrate, what you celebrate, what students come to your institution for, and that, in the end, is a self-fulfilling prophecy about focus in a way that hasn't had to, you know, exclude or alienate uh, anyone, but you get that sense when you used to swim uh, right in the center of the tide and increasingly you find yourself on the edges and then, and then that is a soul searching moment. It's do I uh, dive in where the collective is heading uh, or do, you know, do I not? And, and there is no easy answer because no one uh, you know, would want to alienate any of their colleagues but at some point you can't simply be everything uh, and still have a meaningful coherent message to students, to the community and so forth. The one thing I want to add is that to me one of the simplest ways to do it is you've got to cultivate the youth. I think Gail's question was very prescient and I felt it when I started and the truth of the matter is many young, many young professors come in and they, they, they want to do exciting things and the truth of the matter is they're just their overall commitments just crush them. Plus it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not recognized sufficiently. I think there needs to be a real, a real spirit in the hiring and recruitment and especially through the early years of the, the, the to, to harness that energy. If they want to meet, make make interesting and innovative teaching a core platform of what they're doing. We, personally, I'd be encouraging it from the get-go because I think these young people, you know, I'm old already. I, I, I started at the beginning of the computer movement and it's like these people coming in have much better ideas than I do. Let's encourage them to flourish. Let's not depress them because they're suddenly realizing they're teaching five courses and they're not sure what to do and they have their thesis to complete. Let's make, we do whatever we can to encourage them institutionally to do these great things. That's what I think is key. All right, now we're actually at 3.32 right now. Uh, we've I've only got two more questions. Mr. Chair, do you think we've got three minutes? Three minutes, okay. Thanks very much to the panel. It's really a great, great session. Uh, just a comment and ask for your response in terms of goals of education generally. Uh, my experience being in the field for 42 years as a pracademic uh, is that uh, inspiration and curiosity are the key goals for most educational ventures, including being a lawyer to find an inspirational and, and uh, wonderful role model who will give me curiosity about being a lawyer, and likewise at law school. And the discussions of methodology and goals, especially the death of curriculum reform, um, is often loses that. We go into minutiae of goals and methods, and so how can that grander goal um, be sustained, it seems to me it's a bit back towards Peter's encouragement of young faculty, but also of recruitment becomes the key cur curriculum reform, not, not curriculum reform. Uh, well, let me just share uh, for 30 seconds. I've been part of two major curriculum overhauls at two great institutions that began uh, with an invocation that nothing is off the table. This is soup to nuts. Uh, absolutely everything we do is up for review and within 45 minutes at each institution 80% of the first year curriculum was preserved as ultimately necessary and immutable <laughs> and we argued about legal perspectives and legal process for the rest of the two years so there is something of truth to this uh, fear of asking big questions and I'd say if you make the litmus test what's your claim to why this course this program this approach is absolutely essential to legal education and the values you stand for, very hard to come back and say that's going to look just like contracts and torts and criminal or all the other courses that almost every law school we represent uh, all teach. And if we know that the life of problem solving is lived not in neat compartments, not bite-sized uh, areas that are uh, watertight called these different disciplines, why, why in the world would we teach it that way? Why aren't we teaching problem solving in the way that problems actually arise in the world uh, is a question always stunning to me that we 
we don't ask much of. So it's an inspiration to be reminded that we need to be in the inspiration business, and sometimes we lose sight of it at our own peril. Great, and last question. I heard Hugh Verrier reporting this morning when he talked about the features of an effective lawyer. You pointed to the reporter skill and that uh, uh, one of the disappointments in the law school graduates coming to your firm was they didn't know how to write yet in a plain way like the reporter. And I think that Jerry talked about, uh, you referred to some of the best law teachers and I had a sense they weren't all the fully tenured stream type of people. And I wonder as you're talking here about uh, enhancing the importance of experiential learning, skills training, clinical skills and the like, if anyone thinks that it is an impediment to the excellence of your law school's educational endeavor in the future, that the, the two-tier system remains, the, the tenured stream, if you will, the, the top tier, and the other tier who do writing and skills and that kind of thing, if something has to change. Yeah, I, I think personally, I mean, the really hard thing is making the change because uh, honestly, there are two different hiring tracks, and so people are hired with the different expectations. I, I think that's the hardest thing. It's just how do you turn the course? But absolutely, uh, everyone should be a full citizen of any institution. Ultimately, it, it, it's most fair, it's most right. It, it would be, I, I, I don't, it'd be a better world. I mean, my first uh, and best teaching job in many respects uh, was as an LRW instructor and the first time I ever wrote about legal education was the pedagogy arising from uh, that class. I would wish it on anyone uh, and I take the question also, uh, Alan, to mean that uh, are we valuing it uh, in, uh, in ways that aren't about hierarchies and aren't about, uh, and certainly from the student point of view, uh, you know, it's, it's not. In other words, the best teaching they have, whether adjunct, uh, whether graduate student, whether full-time tenured faculty, uh, is not driven by classifications and status. It's driven by the kind of connections we've been talking about. And, and that ought to uh, be the beacon for the community uh, to value all that teaching as well. It's not to say we don't have full-time tenured faculty for a reason or adjuncts or other programs, but ultimately in terms of contributions to the collective goal, I can't think of why we'd want to create and reinforce those kinds of uh, status demarcations uh, and, and, and little good, it seems to me, has come from, uh, from it where it's happened. Great. Now, I'm just going to quote Scott from yesterday. Panel, you nailed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>